All right, so let's move on and kind of finish what we started on nonlinear optics. Um, so my goal with this little section on nonlinear optics was really to just show the uh, the main principles, and most importantly, to be able to kind of grasp what these nonlinear imaging methods. Uh, what was the underlying principle if you hear about cars in one of the presentations? What what does that mean? Well, what's the nonlinear interaction? Right? What's two photon fluorescence? What's second harmonic generation microscopy? What's at the bottom? Right. So this was a very quick review of um, nonlinear optics. As I mentioned, there are whole books, whole classes. One of them, Professor Carney is teaching a whole class on nonlinear optics. So I encourage you to take that. Um, but the main thing is to realize that really we treat nonlinear optics pretty much like the linear uh, and the linear part. Uh, it's, on purpose, I started exactly how I started the EC460, the undergraduate course, where we have the equation of motion for electrons bound to the nucleus under the effect uh, of the electric field. And really the main difference, what we found last time, was that um, there is a restoring force that is no longer linear with the displacement. Okay? Which in mechanical terms it means that now your spring, as you stretch it a lot harder, the constant, the elastic constant starts to depend on the displacement itself. What happens at the microscopic scale with the electromagnetic field is that actually the reason you're getting these higher powers in displacement is due to the magnetic field actually making a difference, which is something that we ignored in linear optics, right? So we always put E times Z without uh, Q, V cross B, the Lorentz force, but now all that is incorporated here. Okay, so we looked at the second harmonic, uh, we looked at the second order nonlinearity uh, last time, actually not last time, Last time we talked about the exam, right? So the previous time we saw how actually you have to have a uh, non-central symmetric material to have a chi 2 that's non-zero. Okay, that's something very important. Uh, and we found that if you use central symmetric material and the definition of the induced polarization, you get that uh, basically induced polarization equals minus itself, which means it has to be zero. Um, so that makes a difference when you look at the images using second harmonic generation. You only see structures that are really non central symmetric, like, for example, collagen is one of the main key structures that show up in second harmonic for that reason. And we found all the terms. So all kind of both second and third uh, order susceptibilities, what I'm trying to list here is how, where all these new frequencies or new phenomena happen. So we found some frequency generation, different frequency, frequency generation. Uh, in particular case, you get second harmonic. Different frequency generation, in a particular case, you get zero. Okay, so that's called optical rectification. Uh, it's actually DC voltage across your, across your crystal that actually builds up. And therefore, it's harder to measure, like any DC signal. Okay, so let's see, as you can imagine, as you add the third or the terms, you get a lot more com combinations. So the problem, you can think of it as being a nuisance and being complicated, or you can think of it as, you know, a lot more richness, a lot more stuff you can do with the third order nonlinearity. Okay, so I want you to also remember the procedure. You know, I don't expect you to memorize any of these equations. I mean, you should know this. This is just a mass on a spring. But I don't expect you to memorize chi 2 formulas and stuff, but I want you to remember the procedure. Because the procedure is simple, and we've seen it in the Born approximation. The idea that the driving term is actually only um, due to the unperturbed kind of illumination light, or the unperturbed incident light, in the same way we looked at the Born approximation. Um, okay, so let's see how it goes for third harmonic. So we. The total displacement will be x1, so this is the linear response plus the third order nonlinear response. And then this will be the linear equation. 
This, okay. <laughs> this is the, the nonlinear part of it. Yeah? And what we're going to do, we're going to eliminate all the x3 there. So this is basically the restoring force. This is a driving term for this equation. So we're going to move it to the right. And we're going to uh, delete all the terms, neglect all the terms that have x3 in them. What does that mean, physically? When is that true? Very small. So we expect a nonlinear effect that is very weak compared to the incident light. Okay, so let for example, if you generate third harmonic generation, which is going to come out of this, the power of that thing will be orders of magnitude, or at least one order of magnitude below the incident light. It's exactly the same approach we did for the Born approximation, right? Where we said the scattered light is so weak that actually on the driving term we can actually eliminated, which means in the, so basically what happens is that as you propagate light in the crystal, you have your incident light coming in, U of omega. So here let's say you start generating U3 of 3 omega, or U of 3 omega, while continuing to have U of omega. Which means that the source term now should be the fundamental, what you put in, minus what converted in third order harmonic generation, right? That would be the perfect treatment of this. But we're saying that this is so tiny compared to this, it's as if this remains unperturbed, and the source is just what I put in. Exact same thing as in the Born approximation. This will be the incident field, this will be the scatter field, we delete that in the medium. Okay, so if you forget everything, I want you to remember this approach, which is the first order perturbation theory. So this becomes very easy, which means that now I can take x1 from here. So I solve the linear equation first, which gives me x1. So this is just the linear optical response. Okay? And now the cube of that, third power of that, will be the, four, the driving term for the nonlinear part. So that's kind of tractable now. Pretty much everything else is untractable and ugly. And it can only be solved numerically. In the same way, multiple scattering, when you solve the wave equation with multiple scattering, because you have U on both sides of the equation, the field, that also becomes a numerical problem. You cannot get an analytic solution for it. Okay, so that's why we do this first order perturbation. So, X1 is very easy. This is from ECE 460. We did this several times already. So this is the incident field. D is the denominator, that Lorentzian thing, right? That has omega squared minus high gamma omega plus omega naught squared, right? So it has gamma and omega naught in it. Keep in mind, that's the material property. Omega naught is a property of the material, the resonant. Gamma is the, the what? Absorption, but since gamma is a microscopic microscopic quantity that is related to collision, okay? But it's a damping, a loss term, right? But that's where the material property is in the gamma and omega naught. Okay, so this is my linear response. So. Basically, I'm putting all these things into my, it becomes a cube here. So imagine my incident field, I have three different fields, just for generality, just to make a mess of it. So I can put three different fields into my crystal, into my nonlinear optic crystal, and see what the third harmonic generation will do. So because my E is this sum, okay? So it's the cosine of omega 1, cosine of omega 2, cosine of omega 3. When I do the cube of this, <coughs> notice that this becomes a sum 
I get three sums, or three products of three sums, yeah? And it's getting a little messy. And we're writing here how many of those terms actually can exist independently. And you remember the answer? Huh? 216. 6 to power 3. That's how many nonlinear, in, individual nonlinear terms you can have. Interaction terms. Okay, so you can imagine that this is both a bliss, you get so many phenomena to play with, but it could be also hindering your experiments, right? So you get, you're interested in third harmonic, and then on top of it, you get all these other effects that may affect your measurement. Okay. So basically, once you do that third power, this, so this whole thing amounts to e to power 3, right? So you get the, the d's at the bottom, evaluated at each of the omegas. Yep. Then I can introduce the Induced polarization, so this is already macroscopic, is average over the entire um, concentration, and this is the displacement. So this is the nonlinear induced polarization. Okay, so I have the regular induced polarization, the linear one, and on top I have a little bit of this that depends only on x cubed. So why do we like this macroscopic polarization, as I mentioned to you last time? Is that now I can define chi. So P is epsilon naught times this chi. And it's really, this is a tensor. The chi is a tensor. We like it because this goes into the Maxwell's equation. So now I can solve actually wave propagating in crystals once I know the property of the material, which is now in chi. So chi contains all the Ds. The D's contains the omega nuts and the gammas. That's why chi is actually the material properties. In fact, when we talk about microscopic measurements, we always talk about chi. It's chi 2, chi 3. So why is it a tensor, rank 4? Why is that? Because it depends on three different electric fields, which comes back from the fact that that x3 is a cube. Yeah, it's a product of three different fields. So it, it very simply says that if I'm looking at the polarization along direction i, I need to sum all these possible combinations of chi, i, j, k, l, e, j, e, k, e, l. Meaning that if I put my electric fields at omega m along j, polarization along j, yeah, and e, polarization along k at omega n, so this is very general, right? Polarization along L, omega P. So I'm sending three different beams, three different frequencies, three different polarizations. What I get out is governed by this tensor. Many of these terms will be zero. Because if you imagine this is a kind of a hyper matrix, right? So you look at this tensor. Many of the terms in the tensor are zero. For example, if I input uh, this along x and this along y and this also along y, chi will be zero. So there is no polarization there. An example. In fact, symmetries in the crystal um, can reduce reduce the dimensionality of chi from a total of how many how many elements can I have in chi? Chi three. Anybody? I, J, K, L. Each of them are from one to three. How many total? Eighty-one. Three to power four, right? Nine times nine, eighty-one. That's a huge mess. Turns out, you can actually do a tensor contraction 
that I don't think I'm talking about here, but um, tensor contraction that combines the following. I says II equals 1, JJ equals 2, KK equals 3, and then IJ equals I think 6, it's a little backwards. IK is 5 and JK is 4. So instead of having nine terms, nine combinations, you only have six. So if you do for IJ this, and then for KL you do the same thing, you end up with a chi that will be, let's say, S and T with S and T from one to six. So this becomes a matrix that is one, two, three by one, two, three, four, five, six. So that will be your chi 3. Now in a matrix form, this is called contraction of a tensor. It's basically taking into account the fact <coughs> that not all these elements are independent. Okay, even in the most general case, you only end up with 36, 6 times 6 now, 36 elements. So, okay, so this should be 6 to. It turns out, actually, most of these are zero, too. Okay, so that's a parenthesis. So, sounds scary to have 81 possible combinations, 81 possible elements for chi. But in real life, actually, only a few of those matter. Okay? But, the way you look, if you're doing an experiment, you're trying to understand what comes out of that crystal, right? Have, have some kind of prediction, right? That's what the, the theory does. Kind of estimate what's going to come up. You look at this, the table for chi. So you know your crystal, whatever it is. You look at its chi that is tabulated. It's going to be a table that looks like this, contracted already. And then you look at the elements that are non-zero look at the elements that are non-zero, tell you what should be your inputs for which you will get the biggest output, maybe, if you're interested in that, right? And clearly, avoid the ones that give you zero. Yeah? So are we clear on how this thing works? And why? Um, so all these calculations allow you now to actually come up with an exact quantitative formula for chi. That is a macroscopic quantity. Again, this is a measurable thing. Right? Goes in the Maxwell's equations. Once you detect the field, you can come back and get the chi out. But at the bottom is the microscopic understanding of the light matter interaction. Again, with the charge and the fact that the restoring forces have now higher order terms in them. So we are able to actually, we, we computed everything exactly, ex except it gets a little messy because of this third order series. Okay, but it looks actually like this. So in a way, you can always write your higher order nonlinearity non response in terms of your first order nonlinear response. For the tensor, are the inputs frequencies or electric field? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Like, uh, it's a matrix, right? So what factor gets multiplied? Is it a vector of your input frequencies or is it a vector of your input electric fields that come in? And These E's are electric fields. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. These are all electric fields. The indices I, J, K, L tell you what is the polarization? What's the orientation of that electric field? Yeah? So I can have frequency omega p on any of the three dimensions, right? I can have polarization in all three dimensions, right? So L will tell me what that polarization is. Okay? If L is 1, it's going to be along x. If L is 2, along y. If L is 3, along z. 
that will tell me that now chi is locked on 3. And then the, any possible nonlinear effect will be locking L on 3 and looking at the rest of the combinations. Yeah? So then I move on. So I input, now I know my omega n. By the way, they could all be equal, which is most of the most common, but uh, which is called the de degenerate case. But let's say it's a different frequency omega n. So I look, how do I input this? Let's say I input along y. So in that case, the k becomes 2, right? So I look here, chi, now I have these 2, 3, right? I said this was 3, I guess, or what was it, 1? Whatever, so the kl is locked. And I look at my table, table. So by the way, if it's 2, 3, that means my, with the dimension reduction, 2, 3 gives me, you know what, actually I wrote this in a confusing way. This should be 1, 1, 2, 2, that probably makes more sense. So what I meant to say is that um, if you combine i, j together and you get 1, 1, so both of them are x, 2, 2, this is y, y, uh, 3, 3, this is z, z, right? And then you have 1, 2, x, y is 6, uh, 1, 3, that's x, z is 5, and 2, 3 is 4. So what did we say? We locked the, those two here, so that means it's 4. So that means my elements now lie, uh, lie on this line, 4. So I need to look at the other two coefficients and see what are, what's non-zero, right? It's kind of fun to do, actually. It's a little tedious, but okay. So now I have six options. Once I lock two coefficients, I only have six options. And most likely, four or five of them are going to be zero. So that narrows down to, let's say, if this is non-zero, let's pick one. Um, three will be non-zero. So this will be element chi, four, three. Four, three, sorry. even though we locked the last two. So it should have been three, four, whatever. But if this is number three, it means that the other two coefficients have to be three, three. It means the other electric field has to be along z, and you necessarily have to read along z. There will be no nonlinear effect on any other axis other than z at your output. Yeah? Alex, are we cool? Yes. I'm going to have an inspection for my promotion, Alex. I rely on you. OK. Um, so again, don't, don't get blocked by the sum of sum of sum or the, the many combinations. But try to look at the essence of things. So at the end of the day, what we have is a function for the third order nonlinear response, chi 3. And we can express it actually in terms of the linear responses, which look like this. OK. Let's look at some particular phenomena, because that's where it gets actually most practical. Third harmonic generation. Clearly, that is one of the interesting things that happen, right? So I put in a fundamental omega, I get out three omega. That's kind of cool. And I think, yeah, I mentioned to you last time that um, because you excite, you excite with low energy light or photons, if you like. Uh, so in the infrared you can penetrate in the tissue deeper, but then get your visible light out, which has higher resolution. Right? So you excite with long wavelengths, three times longer wavelengths that you actually image. So you get the depth penetration from the long wavelength, and then you get your resolution from the short wavelength, which is kind of nice. So that was the idea with the, the Cornell paper here. Nature Photonics that showed that you can go deeper in the brain, that actually design their own lasers to do all this. It was kind of interesting. So scattering, again, is the bottom line. What, what keeps us from going, like, doing whole body imaging with light, right? 
Okay, so again, you can think of this as having virtual levels, as if I have a photon from here to here, another one from here to here, blah, 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 and then kind of radiative decay from that element, but that, that should not confuse you. Those, there is no real elements, there is no resonant transition between these elements, they do not exist. I want you to think of this more like scattering rather than absorption. Okay, there is no absorption line at 3 omega. It's more like scattering. It's a coherent interaction, actually. Like scattering. Okay? So now, how does chi 3 look like? By the way, this is the notation, the typical notation for your chi. First, you put the frequency that comes out, right? We, we had it before. So now, these are all equal. So I have only one beam coming in, one frequency omega. So omega, 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 the sum of them will give you 3 omega. Okay? So you notice you can have other combinations here. Plus, minus, plus, minus, right? Any of those will generate something. The frequency of the output will be the sum of those. So you notice right away that I can have 3 omega, but I can also have omega. Exactly the frequency I put in. Are you with me? We'll see that in a second. Okay, so more interestingly, what it looks like, and it's exactly like in the second harmonic case, you can think of the uh, third harmonic chi as the linear chi at 3 omega, at the third harmonic, times the linear chi at omega cubed. That's exactly what we got for the second harmonic. It was chi 1 at 2 omega, and then chi 1 at omega squared. which is the direct result of our, basically, of our approximation, you see. That cube shows up in there. Cool? Okay. How about two photon absorption? Well, as I anticipated a second ago, it's as if you have interactions between, let's say, two waves, positive omega means going, I don't know, along a certain axis in time. And now you can have a third one as if it's propagating backwards. Or interaction between a field and this complex conjugate. That's what gives us minus omega here. Right? The response will be D. That cannot be cubed. Did I write that last time? I think that is correct. It has to be power 4 altogether. So you have d times d conjugate because of the minus omega. So that gives you a magnitude of d. d is a real quantity. Everything is real. But now you get d squared, which is due to this. d times this. Right? So you have four terms. D of omega times D of minus omega gives you magnitude square, and then you end up with D of omega times D of omega. That's D squared of omega. What I'm trying to tell you is that, so this is real, but this is complex. So you can write it as, <coughs> you can factor this in front, and then you have the real part of chi 1 square and the imaginary part of chi 1 squared, just expanding that. So what do you get? You get the chi 3. First of all, your light coming out of the crystal is at the same omega as what you put in. So keep that in mind that, yes, occurrence of different frequencies, new frequencies from the system, is a sign of nonlinear interaction. But the other way around is not true. The absence of new frequencies does not, does not prove that your system is linear. You can have the same frequency coming out, but clearly a nonlinear interaction. How does that happen? We got downgraded to one camera. What happened? 
think we didn't get enough likes or clicks. Yeah? Would a laser kind of be like that because you put in uh, one, one color and then that color gets amplified in electric fields, so the power is improved? No, you can think of it, you can understand the laser without, without nonlinearity at all. It's a feedback loop. So essentially, it's a, it's a filter. Your cavity is a filter. But because you have a gain medium. Yeah, I was thinking like the gain medium is kind of nonlinear. No. no? Okay. It doesn't have to be. It can be. It can be. But it, you, the regular low power laser is linear. Instead, instead of having an absorption of decay, it has a growth, exponential growth. Nothing nonlinear about that. Just a sign change. But you can have nonlinear absorption. Which, which is this. So what does it mean? So remember how, how we ended up with these equations? There were E's in there. There were electric fields. In particular, since um, basically polarization is something like chi 3 times E, E, E. I, J, K, and this is I, J, I messed it up, so this J, K, L, and this will be I, J, K, L, and this will be I. There are three fields in here. You can think of this as the elastic constant that depends on the product of these two fields, and this will be just the regular linear response. Okay, so it's like a linear response, but the material properties depend on the square of the field. Which basically means, in this case, you're looking at the material property of the crystal property, both refractive index and absorption, that depend, with the, or depend on the square of the field, which means intensity. So, the higher your power, the higher the absorption. The higher your power, the higher or lower your refractive index, depending on the sign. That's what it means. It means that I can have, actually I was drawing all this last time, but I had the pictures right here. So here's the real part. So by the way, you can write your refractive index, the new refractive index as the linear one, the one that we use on a normal day. yeah. And then you have the nonlinear part, which is proportional to the intensity. And we were talking last time, I was telling you how you can, your crystal actually becomes a lens. Because you have a Gaussian beam coming in. You have clearly higher intensity in the center. right? The refractive index becomes either higher or lower depending on the sign of the, this nonlinearity. You can have both. So it's really, this is a definition of a lens. This is a kind of a green lens. Graded index. Yeah? So if you have a positive lens, you can actually tune your power such that to compensate the, the natural diffraction of the beam, you can actually bring it back to perfectly collimated just by tuning your power, which plays with kind of changes the focal distance of your lens, if you like. Okay? So this is the refractive index part. This is the real part. So N2, both of these are complex, right? So this will be this one, N2 prime. How about this one? N2 double prime. What does that do? It's absorption. What does that mean? That is used in some lasers. Saturable absorbers. absorbers. So saturation is a nonlinear effect, by definition. Whenever you have a phenomenon that saturates, it means that instead of going, whatever the signal it is, your output growing linear with your input, it saturates. Okay, so that means it's no longer linear. So in this particular case, what it means is that, let's say my medium Okay, so this is the M prime. Do I have an N double prime? Okay.
Okay, so it is like this. It simply attenuates, right? But imagine what happens. Um, the higher the power, the higher the absorption. So, guess one application for this thing. What would that be good for? Maybe like photodynamic therapy. Photodynamic, so killing the patient so it doesn't suffer anymore. <laughs> Whenever we talk about nonlinear absorption in human beings. <laughs> but, okay, so what do you mean? Um, like maybe you have like some tumor inside some tissue and you want to focus it down to a point. And yeah. You want to ablate until you get to that, like, kind of like two photon. Yeah. Um, but you can use this to get the absorption effects at that point. Well, you realize two photon fluoresces is based exactly on this. Yeah, so like instead of, uh, oh yeah, okay. It's also absorbing the energy, yeah. Yeah, okay. But here's another thing. So the higher the power, the higher the absorption. Wouldn't it be cool if you had glasses like this? I mean, the, actually the, what do you call it, heliomatics? The, the polarization-based ones are doing kind of that. With the ones that get dark when you go outside, it's a nonlinear effect. Okay, but actually I know people, my former professors from Creole, one of them, uh, got money for decades from the Department of Defense for pilots. So a pilot flying a warplane somewhere and then people shooting lasers at you. Uh, it would be nice to have the windows and whatever goggles made of this kind of material. So you make optical limiters, it's called. Um, so you can make it such that the absorption goes up with power or the absorption goes down with power. So you can, of course, as a limiter, you want the absorption to go up with power, so it protects you. But you can actually have in a laser, you can mod lock lasers with saturable absorbers, which actually uh, absorb for a while and then they become transparent. So it's kind of like they absorb for a while and then the, po the power builds up. And then it becomes transparent, it releases the pulse. Okay? And then it absorbs again. Once the pulse reaches enough power, then it opens the gate. So you create very short pulses like that with saturable absorbers. Okay? So keep in mind that the sign difference makes a make, makes sign change makes a difference. Um, but of course, probably for imaging, the most common applications of the nonlinear absorption is in two photon fluorescence. Yeah? So instead of uh, instead of exciting like linear fluorescence with one photon, you can now excite with two. It's exactly the response at the frequency that you put in. So if you design your fluorophore that has a peak of absorption, I mean, if you take the same fluorophore that you normally you excite with UV, <coughs> the exact same fluorophore can now be excited with half the energy of the UV, right? Which will be somewhere red or near infrared. So you put two of those, and that's it. What's the advantage of that? Two photon fluorescence. Huh? Penetration depth, again, yeah, it's much better. And also viability. So if you look at live cells or tissues, um, it's much better to excite with infrared than with UV, right? Because the UV light has enough energy to actually dissociate, among other things, DNA and other molecules, right? That's why we put sunscreen on. So it's all from here. Okay, so the same response modulates the phase. So think about going back to the real part, back and forth from real to imaginary part. Real part, it means that if I crank up the power enough on my laser, it starts to see its own effects on the glass, on the crystal. Cannot be glass. On the crystal, right? So it affects itself. 
That's how this <coughs> you can make these solitons. So this is called self-phase modulation. For obvious reasons. But you can do all kinds of other cool things with it. So it's called a pump probe experiment. So this is a Chi 3 material. This is my one field U of omega. And then let's call it pump U. Probe will be R, since P is the same. We go by the second letter. UR is probe. UU is pump. So basically, high power on the pump to change the refractive index. The refractive index will be N2 will be, uh, oh, I'm sorry, N nonlinear. By the way, it will be N2 times U pump squared. That's the intensity. And now I come with a little probe. So the little probe doesn't need to have high power. This is my reader. It's coming in whoop, and change, kind of getting the change in the refractive index and reporting to me, maybe, the property of the crystal. You see? So it doesn't have to, you don't have to have the same beam to in, induce the effect and also kind of record it. This will be affected by its own self-phase modulation for sure. But if you want to do a clean measurement of that N2 change, pump probe is better because now U2 is low power, so its own nonlinear effect is zero. This only sees the linear. It sees the refractive index that we introdu was introduced by this one. So here's a cool application that I was so excited when I learned about it when I was a student like you. Um, optical switching. I can send, I have bin splitter, usually in communications, right? I have a fiber in, splits in two. I can send the light 100% on this or 100% on this without electronics, just by shooting a laser and inducing this phase shift in one of the bin splitters or in one of the, let's see how it will work. So. The idea is kind of like this. So let's say I have a microson interferometer. I think uh, usually it's a mag zender for communication, but whatever. So this will be my source. So if I adjust this so they're in phase, perfectly in phase, tau equals zero, what am I going to get here at the detector? Maximum intensity. Good. Now, if I put tau lambda over uh, c tau lambda over 2, what do I get? Minimum intensity. So that will be, okay, so if I plot the intensity with equal power, it will look like this. This will be I max. This will be zero. True? Yes. Where is the power going? My source is giving me, giving me this, the same amount of power. And it's like magic. I'm shifting this by half a micron, and my power is gone. Not a little bit, all of it. I lose all my power. Where is it? Where? Magnetic field. What do you mean? I mean, the power is kind of flowing back between the electric and magnetic field. Is that what you mean? Okay, so that is certainly true, but I should be able to measure uh, power flow somewhere else to conserve the energy. It cannot stay in the magnetic field. It goes, right? Where is it? Back to the source. 100%. Back to the source. If you're not careful, you burn your source. I, I have done that. By the way, this is a question for my qualifier. <laughs> True story. And I never thought of it. Um, 
Okay. So now think about this. Where's the switching coming from? If I'm doing this, um, I'm putting here a crystal and I'm hitting it with a laser with a pump. You pump. And I'm hitting it just enough such that my N2 times the intensity times the thickness of the thing maybe times 2 because it's back and forth who cares if that's exactly lambda over 2 I am able to switch the entire power from here to here is that cool? So, of course, this is not very practical. You send power to the source, you will need to put another bin splitter here, which is not very effective. I think the real way you do it in optical communication is with the Mach Zender. So your source is here. So remember, Michelson is across, Mach Zender is a rectangle, right? So how do you, okay, like that, like that. Like this is mirror, this is mirror. Okay, so two beams, one goes this way, one goes this way. Then you have two beams here and two here. Now that makes more sense. So I put my crystal on one of them, I hit it with the pump, with the N2, and I'm able to switch from this to that. 100%. No electronics. Super fast. This is really fast. This response, nonlinear response, is femtosecond scale. Okay, so the challenge is how fast can I send the pulse to this crystal? So that can be done very fast. So uh, people were doing research back when I was a student, and I think I think this is pretty well established. Now. But I thought it's very nice because it's as if you really control the light from a distance, right? You operate some way here, and all of a sudden you change the power here, then here. It looks, yeah. Are you excited? Okay. Okay. Four wave mixing. Well, four-wave mixing is nothing more but mixing four waves. In the sense that you put three in and you look at the fourth. So the idea is that you need to conserve both energy and momentum. For, right? So what you put in should match what you get out at the individual photon level. Let's see how this works. Because one application I'm sure you're going to like. Okay? So, if I have this crystal, chi 3 crystal here, I put one, two, three waves in, I get the fourth wave out. That is very well prescribed. It cannot be random. It's a very deterministic effect. What comes out has to match the K such that K1, K2, K3. Whoop. This is perfectly, the momentum is matched perfectly. And the frequency of that thing has to match the combination of the, so it's going to be omega 1 minus omega 2 plus omega 3, something like that. In various combinations. Okay? One application of this is phase conjugation. Phase conjugation was first published by another one of my professors. His name is Zeldovich. 1973. In a Russian journal that you cannot read. Um, but later, it was demonstrated by Ariv at Caltech. 1976, I think. Okay, that's less important. Uh, and then another gentleman used a different linearity. But anyway, so they're close together. But the idea is actually nice. So forget the different frequency. I have the same frequency. I have three beams coming in. One, two, three. If I have one and two, the moment I add the third one, 
What comes out of the crystal is exactly the opposite of E3. Let me say that one more time. If I have E1 and E2 facing each other, the third beam that comes in will generate an output that is exactly the opposite of its, its opposite. Do you see that? Basically, you can see it immediately by the momentum conservation. Right? So these two kind of cancel each other out in case. Right? So if I put a third one that is not canceled, what comes out can only be such that it cancels that thing. So can you imagine an application for this thing? No, it's a phase conjugation mirror. The regular mirror is very, very different. Um, the mirror, okay, here's the difference. The mirror basically, if you put any field in, the, you know what, how the mirror, what the mirror does? I mean, you do, right? You know how to make an image in it. You look at it every morning. But what does it do in terms of momentum? Let's get scientific about it. First of all, where is the image? Your image is in the wall. It's behind the mirror, right? So that makes it a virtual image. You know how to make an image in a, in a flat mirror, right? If not, I recommend you go take 460 next summer. So you take two rays, one that goes in here, one that goes in here, this goes back. The one that goes, reflects off, the continuation of it will meet with the continuation of the other one and give you a face that looks deep into the wall. And it, because it's not the actual rays that meet, but their continuation kind of in the back, that is a virtual image. You cannot see it, you cannot detect it, there is no light here. The reason we see it is because we use our own, a new lens that makes this image into a real image on our retina. Okay, that's a different story. Well, how, how does it work, really? So I have this ray in, although I don't like much the word ray, especially in this context. It has this component, so K, K, oops, KZ, and this is KX. What does the mirror do? I get this thing out. K, this will be the K, Z, K prime, let's call it K prime. All vectors, right? And Kx. What did the mirror do? Conserves Kx. Conserves Kx. Very good. Kx is the same. What else? Reflects KZ. That's all it does. KZ prime equals minus KZ. And notice a refractive surface does the exact same thing with the convention that reflection is the minus refractive index of the transmission. You know what I mean by that? We're digressing again, but I think this is important. So if I have a K vector in and this refracts here, so assuming N2 is bigger than N1, it gets closer to the normal. Nothing happens to Kx, so you already notice I made the bad drawing. Kx is constant. Only Kz changed. If n is bigger than n1, clearly um, this has to tilt towards the origin. While it's keeping this component constant, it has to account for the fact that my total k is bigger, is proportional to n2 rather than n1. This is true for anisotropic crystals for everything, so it's a very useful thing to know that actually Kx is conserved. Fresnel's equations for reflection, all those equations that tell you how much power you reflect and or the field, is based on this. It's basically nothing more but this. It's also a mechanical thing when you bounce a ball on a surface, right? If you don't have friction, nothing happens here. It only happens on the normal to the surface. Okay, so basically Kx is constant here. When you have reflection, N1 equals minus N, or N2 equals minus N1, 
and that's why you get your KZ negative. Whew, enough of the parentheses. So coming back to the phase conjugated mirror versus regular mirror. Regular mirror makes KZ into minus KZ. This is mirror. Two R's. Phase conjugation mirror makes K into minus K. It reverses the KX2. And any other component for that matter. It really reverses the K altogether. If you have a, you know, let's say you're making a laser and you have a single mode and you hit the Gaussian beam with a curve, is that also phase conjugation? Or is it just a special case where it just reverses it entirely? It is a phase conjugation, and you know why it works? Because you are at small angles. Or you're matching the phase. So you're matching. Yeah. If, if you have high angles. OK, that's an interesting question, actually. So the question is, for if I, get the Gauss, if I get the surface that matches the wave front, that becomes a phase conjugate mirror. But it only works in small angle approximation, because if you have very large angles, you get these aberrations, which means that, um, let's say I'm focusing this really diverse K distribution. You're going to get different focuses. So for example, you are going to get the focus for small angles here, a tighter focus for the larger angles, you see? So in that case, it's not going to phase conjugate properly. It's going to be. But for small angles, this is going to give you the Gaussian beam that you did at the homework. The, that theory was for small angle approximation. So in that case, you can reverse your beam at will. You can make a Gaussian here, focus it, defocus it, bring it back to Gaussian, don't lose anything. That only works, interestingly enough, for small angles. Well, there's more to talk about phase conjugation, actually. But interestingly, uh, so this was developed in the seven, in seventy three. Uh, since two thousand eight, there was a Nature Photonics paper applying this idea to seeing through thick tissues, because now notice what happens is if you have a phase conjugator, so I pass my light through chicken breast. That was the Nature Photonics paper, by the way. So it becomes completely messed up, right? If I could reverse that wave front perfectly it will come back and form a plane wave here. Which means that, for example, if I focus the light in, it's not going to focus nicely through the chicken breast. It's going to look like a mess again. But if I face conjugate it, or if I pre-mess pre up the wave front with the opposite, with the conjugate wave front that is at the output, I will be able to focus deep in the tissue, much deeper than usual. So what I'm trying to tell you is that now, 30 years later, 30-some, this field is, is hot again, starting with the paper from 08. Okay? So notice, the difference between regular mirror and phase conjugate mirror is that actually it's reversing all case. So if, for example, if you have a point source here reflected on a mirror, it's going to go that way. With a phase conjugate, it means it comes this way, it goes right back comes this way, it goes right back. It doesn't go like this. Okay, that's the big difference. So retro reflectors in the road are kind of like that. They are in the very geometrical optics regime. You have little prisms that kind of do the same thing. So no matter how you illuminate those little things in the road, you know what I'm talking about, right? So no matter the angle, although the variation is not that much on the highway, but no matter the angle, it goes right back at you. So that's useful. Okay, so in four minutes we're going to talk about stimulated Raman and cars. Ready? People make careers out of this. Okay, first of all, what is Raman scattering? Molecular vibrations. All molecules are at room temperature or at finite temperature. They are under vibration, excited by Brownian motion. Then what? Scattered, 
scatter. Not emit, scatter. So you have molecular under mole molecules under vibrations. You s illuminate them with light. There are two scenarios. One, you found a molecule that is already excited by KBT, by brown emotion. It interacts with your light and somehow it decays. So it gives you your initial light plus that little energy due to the vibration. Right? Another scenario which turns out to be more probable is that you find it in the ground state, not excited on the vibration state. It interacts with your light. It takes away a little bit of energy and ends up excited on a vibrational. Why is the second one more probable? You have to be in phase to get the first one. You have to be in phase. Your electric field has to be in phase with the vibration and then hit it at the right moment to couple the energy. Okay, so your field is in phase with the vibration. That makes me uncomfortable. There will be more molecules on the ground state, according to Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution, meaning, right? So it's an exponential, right? The lower the energy, the higher the probability. So a lot more at room temperature of the molecules will be in ground state. That's why. Very simple. OK, so this is the two scenarios. The first one, excite with the laser. You get the stokes, uh, and then you leave the one excited, that's called the stock shift, shift, so that gives you sh shorter wavelengths, lo lo longer wavelengths, sh slightly smaller <coughs> frequency, lower frequency. And the opposite is called anti-stokes, where you find a molecule excited here, and then it comes back with the laser plus the vibrational energy. That's called the anti-stokes. This is a spontaneous one. This is called spontaneous Raman. This happens with any material pretty much any time. The probability is very, very low. So I think Kimani Toussaint has a slide where something like this. Light from the sun will generate a Raman photon every hour, or maybe that's too much. But like 10 to minus 6 probability. Only one in billions of photons will convert to a Raman scattering. Do you know the story with Raman? He's like on a sailboat and he's looking at the ocean. I'm not sure if it was a sailboat, but on a boat. Yeah. I think one of these. Yeah, yeah. like steamboat. Steamboat, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he wrote, he published this, he got a Nobel Prize for it while on a boat. So I think he was worried about scooping, so he was somehow. I thought he was just trying to explain why the ocean is blue. That's how he got the idea, why, why the, the colors in the ocean. But <clears throat> not so sure the Raman is still the explanation for that, but okay. All right, so how do we explain, how do we put it in the context of what we've done so far? Most of the books will explain Raman as a polarizability that changes with your electric field. So polarizability is these things that, this thing that factors into the induced dipole, so that should be a small p. But it's really nothing more but When you write the force, so okay. So the way Raman is treated usually, I'm trying to bring it to what we've done so far. So you expand the polarizability, this is the linear part, this is the part that dis depends on the displacement, notice? So that makes it nonlinear. When you plug that polarization, you write an energy, which is the polarization times the electric field, blah, blah, blah. The force is the derivative of the energy with respect to displacement. So at the end of the day, you get the force that really is square in the electric field. That is exactly the chi-3 phenomenon that we've been talking about. Okay, this is why the refractive index depends on E squared. Okay, so if you see this polarizability thing, it's nothing more but the chi-3 phenomenon. So let's see. This is the linear response, and I have wait, 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 wait. the nonlinear response
Hmm. Oh, okay, so here's the incident field. That's what I didn't see. So this is the laser plus the laser conjugate. This is what I put in. This is the Stokes and the Stokes conjugate. And when you put them all in, because of the square, you will get all these combinations uh, due to this convolution here. So it's all as usual now, except the bottom starts to look like this. We'll review this next time. But the bottom line is, how do I enhance this? Uh, how do I make that chi huge? Well, I can make it huge if I make these two terms disappear. You see, if they match each other, the denominator becomes the smallest possible chi becomes the largest possible. So it becomes a resonantly enhanced phenomenon when my laser minus omega laser minus omega stokes equals the vibration level. So if I tune my laser to be exactly the stokes plus the vibrational, something magic happens. This denominator becomes so small, the chi becomes so huge, and it's actually orders, many orders of magnitude, higher signal than the spontaneous Raman. Okay, that's why we call it a stimulated Raman. Okay? That's kind of the idea. We'll, we'll review this next time, so don't worry. It's entirely imaginary. It's another interesting thing. So you can have super amplification, but you can also have uh, the absorption. So this is amplification, and this is the regular absorption line. So if you want to do imaging, you better pick the amplification one, right? Okay. <laughs>